This is Transformation Ground Control. Your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm here with Parisa Noble as as usual, and also with Kyler Cheatham from our uh, marketing team at Third Stage. Uh, Parisa and Kyler, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So we have uh, extra uh, guest guidance here today with with Kyler. You being on the show, and I know you've been a part of uh, some of our events, some, a lot of our online events. Uh, you've been a part of here in recent years, and. Uh, Excited to have your perspective and commentary on the show today as well. So welcome to your first time episode of Ground Control. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, excited to have you both. And as our listeners know, and as you both know, a, a big part of our show and one of the biggest themes, if not the biggest theme, is just transformation in general and how digital technologies and emerging technologies can affect transformation and how it affects the world in general. And a lot of what we've been talking about on this show has been related to uh, digital transformation and, and emerging technologies in particular is one area we've covered uh, in quite a bit of detail on the show as far as new up and coming technologies and how it can apply to your transformation, as well as change management and how change management relates to or enables some of those emerging technologies. And one of the more exciting emerging technologies in the world today is uh, this whole uh, concept of electric vehicles. And I know, uh, Parisa, you've, you've sort of done some research on this and some discussion points for us. I'll turn it over to you and, and let you take, take it from there on the whole electric vehicle front. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I started to scratch the surface and it turned to be pretty fascinating. So I went pretty deep in the rabbit hole. So I'm excited to share what I found with you guys. But the most interesting thing um, that really caught my eye is that there are reports out there that they believe by 2040, 70% of new vehicle sales are going to be electric vehicles. That is a huge jump. That is an overwhelming majority of all auto sales. And to just put it into perspective, right now we are sitting globally at about 4 to 5%. I think it's about 4.5% of electric vehicles and you know the market share that they own. And most of that is in Europe and China. We have a little bit here in America. But there is a huge push for it, both because I think there's a lot of people who are passionate about it, but there's also incentives that the government's rolling out um, with tax deductions, et cetera, that if you drive an electric vehicle, maybe it's a tax deduction. Now, this report is saying it will be at 70 percent without any additional government you know, intervention, um, any additional initiatives put forth by any global government. So. I, I am interested as to how we're going to get there. And I'll get to that in a second, because there seems to be a lot of roadblocks of, of, you know, adopting it. And I think we always talk about change management and it's just something so new, you know, Henry Ford made the car and we put gasoline in it and we've been driving it like that for years and years. And to make the human race kind of pivot and change to a charging station, I think is a big jump um, that we can dissect in a second, but Looking at that, it made me explore which companies are really taking on and embracing the electrical vehicles, um, and it's everybody. I mean, there's Audi, BMW, Chevy, Cadillac, Ford, you name it. Everybody has at least one electric vehicle. Some are maybe a little bit better than others. Obviously, don't forget Tesla. Um, they kind of are pioneering the the whole movement, but the biggest thing is, you know, the bigger trucks like the Hummers and the F-150s, those are new. And I was looking into what Ford is rolling out and they have the Ford Lightning coming in 2022. That is a fully electric vehicle. And then I started to look into what is that, like what is the range? You could get 230 miles on one charge for Ford Lightning. That's what they're projecting, right? But then that compares to a thousand miles with gasoline. 
Um, and you know, it's, of course you can stop and charge, but also if you're going on a road trip, I feel like, you know, how is that even feasible at this point? So I'm curious to hear your guys' thoughts. I mean, we're talking about, you know, emerging technologies, if you will, emerging automobiles, but that also is going to pivot into emerging, you know, new ways of charging and, and, you know, are gas stations going to look the same as they do today and in 50 years? So my thought is, are we just going to tack on a charging station to existing gas stations? Or do you think there is going to be full on charge stations out in the middle of nowhere <laughs> for cars to recharge when they're on the road? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's a great question. You have, there's so much in that, what, what you just said, there's so many uh, things that come to mind as far as, you know, everything from technological advancement to just the, the change management issues that you're sort of alluding to that, that go along with that. Um, but I think you're hitting on, you know, the, the question about whether or not you, you have charging stations throughout, you know, every gas station, or if it's a whole new sort of infrastructure that's set up separately from the existing infrastructure. Um, I think that pr raises a bigger issue or question around, you know, how, you know, how will, how will the U S for example, get to that 70% adoption rate when cars and big muscular cars are such a part of our culture. You know, it's not just about driving from point A to point B for at least in, in America where we're all at. Um, other parts of the world, maybe not so much, but I'm, I'm curious to see how that evolves or how we get to that 70%, not just in terms of how do we support it with the infrastructure, but also how do you get past that cultural aspect of us just wanting to know that we have the freedom to get in the car and drive a thousand miles and not have to worry about charging it. Um, and even if we only do that once a year or whatever, it's, I think it's, there's still this fear in people's minds that, oh, well, if I get an electric car, I can't do that. So maybe I should just stick to my, my gas guzzling car. So I know, I know myself, I, I drive a big SUV. I like having an SUV and there's something about just having a big engine and a big car that just, I don't know, I just like it. And so for me personally, there's a change management issue, um, with, with, with moving to that, even if you had electric, uh, charging stations at every you know corner. Um, cause to your point, you'd still have to stop and charge and, and whatnot. So I don't know that I have a good answer for that. I don't know how that'll evolve or how I'm sure it'll probably play out unevenly throughout the world. I would suspect in different parts of the world, they're going to embrace it a little faster than, and we're, I think we're already seeing that from, from what you're saying, but what are your thoughts, Kyler? Yeah, I think the, the cultural integration is, is definitely a consideration. Um, but I do think that there'll be charging stations, whether it is, domestic for us right here in the U.S. or abroad, and this new emerging industry of charging per transaction um, per car, and just these standalone kind of new um, emerging of industries that actually has the car as a, a piece of their overall business model. So I think that on that side, um, that will definitely be something that we'll continue to see pop up. Like we, we have a local mall, right, that has um, a parking area that's just for electric vehicles. So we've already seen that kind of start to make that change. I don't know if, if we here in the U.S. will get to 70%, but I'd be really curious for our international counterparts of, of what that looks like for them. Um, I think for me, from the change management perspective that you kind of surfaced, you know, you hear all of these, um, and we've we've experienced many of them, um, cyber attacks, that cybersecurity, and now we're totally reliant on the safety of our friends and family and loved ones on a software. So I think that for me would be the biggest barrier for change management. I'm I'm just curious, like you guys from a software perspective, Eric, you probably know a little bit higher level than Parisa and I, but like, what does that take to trust human lives with the software? Like we don't even do that in planes, right? So of course we rely on software, but we've seen a lot of challenges with Boeing and those types of things. So how do you, how do you see that from like a technical perspective? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And, and even just the you know, one, one other topic that we've covered on past episodes of, of ground control of this podcast is the whole supply chain aspect of it too. So now you're talking about a lot of different electrical components and, you know, things that are unique parts that aren't necessarily as mainstream as your traditional auto parts. And even in uh, traditional gas guzzling cars right now, there's a lot of 
uh, auto part uh, supply shortages based on chips, which I know, Parisa, that's one topic you've covered and researched in, on this show in the past. So that's a whole other issue you get into now, which is how do you ensure that the supply chains aren't disrupted for this, you know, merging technology and all the raw materials and components that that go into that. Um, so yeah, both it's a great point, and it just triggered another you know thought, which is that supply chain piece of it as well. Yeah, and Kyler, you're you're also referring to the self driving phenomenon too, right? If I'm not yeah, mistaken, right, right, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that opens up a whole new can of worms because I agree. I mean. I, I remember in Vegas, I rode a uh, self-driving, it was almost like an Uber. So it was, they picked us up and they had two people that were testing it and making sure it wouldn't, you know, go haywire on us and go drive into a ditch somewhere, but they were monitoring it. And even so, they still had to override it a few times because it couldn't identify that, you know, the bush that was kind of in hanging or the tree hanging over into the lane was n- not another car and that we didn't have to stop in the middle of the road. You know, like there's still so many software glitches that I assume it's, I mean, is it AI that's helping run those, Eric? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know a lot about the the technology behind it. I would suspect it is. I would suspect there's an, either an AI or machine learning component where, you know, it's, it's, you've got a program and it learns, you know, different patterns and, you know, recognizes different things like obstacles and, um, weather conditions and things like that. Um, but yeah, that's super interesting that you've, you've actually been in one. I've read, I've read a lot about them, but it, yeah. it's cool that you've been inside. Yeah, it was really cool. cool. They didn't let us take any pictures or film it. It was very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they, I mean, it was, it was, we're just not there yet. I would never trust a self driving vehicle with my family, at least, at least not right now until there's proof of concept. And, you know, it's what comes first, the chicken or the egg. You have to have people who are willing to test it and ride in it and optimize it before, you know, it'll be widely accepted, which I think also trickles into just the conversation around electric vehicles and the, you know, big picture wise. If we're, you know, if you're so used to the feeling of your truck and your SUV, like I hear what you were saying, Eric, I have the SUV myself and there's something about being able to pack everybody in and being able to go on a road trip somewhere um, and not have to worry about pulling over and charging my car for 10 hours um, after just a quarter of the distance that I could have gone if I have a, you know, a car that's running on gasoline. So I, I definitely think that we are very much deeply attached to the cars that we have right now. And I think to get to that 70%, there's going to be a lot of changes that need to be made as far as rolling out new charging stations and just making it easier and more accessible. Maybe the battery life can last longer or, you know, it doesn't take 20 years to charge it so that you are able to go on a road trip, you know, and it's interesting. Yeah. And it's, it's, I would imagine get a very pretty significantly, not just country by country, but within any given country or region of the world, you have the urban areas where maybe it's a little bit more feasible to have a 250 mile range versus, you know, if you live in a rural area where you have to drive, you know, 50 miles into town or 50 miles to work or whatever. Um, that's a totally different adoption scenario and level or degree of change management that would be required to, to get yeah, there. That's right. And you, another thing I, I came across is that there's a handful of global governments. So, you know, I think Canada, the European <laughs> Union and the United States are a, a few of them, but they have an ambitious goal to hit uh, net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And yes, to do that, you know, these cars that we're driving, it plays a big role. But there's also like just thinking about supply chain pieces, semi trucks. I mean, they're one of the biggest gas guzzling carbon emitting machines out there next to airplanes, I would imagine. Right. So it's it's hitting those things. I feel like will move the needle more than, you know, just everybody's independent car. Obviously, it all plays a big role and it works together. It's a holistic approach. But the, the distance thing, it comes back to, you know, you can't drive the thousand miles. You have to stop and recharge. So if we have these long routes that semi trucks have to drive from California to Tennessee through, you know, to the East Coast, I mean, hitting hitting the nail on the head with an electric commercial fleet is way down the line. And there's companies like Volvo and Tesla who are working on these um, electric semi trucks, but 
we are a long way <laughs> from from getting there. I mean, I think Volvo is they were able to hit the last mile of delivery. So, you know, I guess if it's just in, in the neighborhood, they can make a delivery. Um, and then Tesla's semi project um, has been delayed multiple times. And actually this week they had one of the leaders of the project leave the company. So, you know, there's a lot of hoops that we're going to have to jump through to get there. Um, and that's just the, from the logistical side. And then you have to look at the change management side and how it's literally going to be a paradigm shift for all of us to adopt a completely new form of transportation. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's pretty exciting and fascinating all, all at the same time, just to think about all the different dynamics and all the, the things that, that factor into it. And just, you know, like you said, building the infrastructure around it, the change management, the supply chain, um, all that good stuff. And it's also just an interesting reminder, kind of bringing it back full circle to business and digital transformation of how hard it is to get people to change, especially these long um, tenured or long term beliefs that people have. I mean, you're trying to change their beliefs and change their views of the world. And, um, you know, that's, I, I think what we're seeing here is in, in some of these examples are how, how difficult that can be. Yeah, definitely. And what a time to be alive, right? You know, if you would have told us 20 years ago that Jeff Bezos could get me dog food to my doorstep in a day, I would have been like, what? You know, so so having the ability to be adaptable, I think, if anything, in the last year, it's showed you the ability that technology really gives us to transform entire industries. Because we've, we've seen that in, you know, 15 months, 18 months time. So, um, you know, we'll see. This will be something that we'll continue to, to monitor and, and learn about. But, you know, obviously transportation, specifically vehicle transportation and the auto industry, it'll be interesting to see, you know, if we continue to see our um, foreign partners continue to manufacture these. Or, you know, you mentioned Ford, which is, you know, a U.S.-based company, if they'll continue to try and you know, create these emerging technologies as well to keep up with that um, as well. So, so definitely a very interesting talk topic. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be curious to see where, where it all goes and how quickly the, the adoption happens. And what's interesting about it too, is it's not like the electric car concept is a completely new idea. I mean, it's, it's been in development and it's been around for a while, but it seems like we're finally reaching maybe a tipping point where there's enough momentum behind it, enough, um, enough, auto manufacturers are focused on it. There's enough consumer demand that is sort of shifting that way. And it, it kind of reminds me of a cloud technology in a lot of ways, you know, just to relate it back to enterprise technology and digital transformation. I mean, it's, it's sort of the same thing where cloud is not really that new. It's been around for a long, long time. I mean, more than 20 years, 25 years or more, but it's just in the last five or seven years, it's really sort of shifted in that direction. So uh, I'd be curious to see if the same thing happens with, with uh, the auto industry right. too. I guess we'll find out. We'll keep it, keep an eye on it. Touch base in 30 years. Yeah. See if they were right. <laughs> yeah. In the meantime, I'm not an early adopter of this sort of stuff. So I'm yeah. going to stick to my SUV, I'll but uh, maybe the next couple of years. <laughs> yeah. I'm right there with you. I'm going right. to stick with the SUV and no robot is going to drive me around, but maybe that's just <laughs> my yeah, the, thoughts on that. <laughs> The robot part, I yeah, I'm, I would definitely be a slower adopter to that than the electric the electric car piece of it. I'm just curious, Parisa, I forgot to ask you, who, who was it that was like, what service was that? Was that Google or who was it that was doing that Vegas uh, auto car service? Do you I remember? want to say it was Active. Uh, oh, okay. I think that's what it was called. Definitely started with an A, if that helps you. But <laughs> okay. they yeah, were, I was like, well, I yeah, they were partnered with. <laughs> Uber. So we called an Uber and oh. Uber, I believe is, is utilizing their, their expertise in building out the, the software. So. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cause there's so many companies that are doing that. They're investing in that between, you know, like you said, Uber, I knew they were doing it and Google and, you know, the auto manufacturers are partnering with companies to offer these self-driving services and whatnot. So I'd be curious, curious to see who wins that battle too. That's, that's even more emerging than uh, the electric car concepts. Yeah. So it's pretty cool stuff. It is. I it mean, is. There's... It's that automation is just, Parisa and I actually have a background with um, some vendors or clients that were working on um, parking with IoT. So basically you would drive over and it would capture your license plate and be able to, you know, 
do the transaction right there instead of having the user do anything but pull into the parking spot. So definitely lots of AI and machine learning involved in that type of thing too. Yeah. Yeah. Making it so we it's just have cool. to sit back and let the robots do it all. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, that that kind of leads us to our, our guest that we're going to introduce right after the break, uh, Jonathan Reed from Diginomica. Um, he's he's going to be on the show and we're going to talk a bit about uh, more about emerging technologies and just general trends in the transformation in, in digital and enterprise technology space. Uh, I think the difference here, though, is we'll, I think we're both the goal in that conversation is going to maybe bring it back down to earth a little bit as far as kind of what's pragmatically happening right now. Not that electric cars aren't happening right now, as, as you pointed out, they are happening, but there's other things and other trends in the uh, enterprise technology space that are that are more immediate that we want to uh, cover in that discussion. So I'm excited to have uh, Jonathan on. But before we bring him on and introduce him, we'll take a quick break and we'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. We'll be right back. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Okay, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. I'm here with uh, Parisa Noble and Kyla Cheatham, and we are uh, excited to have our next guest on the show, um, Jonathan Reed from Diginomica, which is a media outlet that focuses on enterprise technology and digital transformation and, and really just technology in general. It's a pretty wide-spanning or, or far-reaching outlet that covers a lot of different topics. Very fascinating uh, publication, not just because of the topics they cover, but also just the style. Um, I, I like their innovative, disruptive style. Um, and Jonathan in particular is a very entertaining writer. He's very, very smart guy, but also very entertaining to read and, and, and talk to. So I'm excited to have um, Jonathan on the phone. So or on the on the podcast, I should say. So uh, Jonathan, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, good to be here, Eric. It's nice to be in the hot seat. I have my own video show later on Fridays usually, and uh, I'm usually interviewing, but it's really, really nice to sit in the chair. I had to pre prepare harder for this, but it'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're the tables have turned now. You're, you're the one yeah, getting interrogated here instead of the yeah, other way around. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, and you have a unique perspective, um, and, and I want to get to that here in a second on some of your thoughts on, on what's going on here in the industry. But maybe to start, just tell us a quick overview of your your background, how you grew up in the space, and maybe why you got in the space. You know, you're, you're crazy like I am to be doing this stuff. So, uh, what? How'd you start, and what, what's a little bit about your background? Well, it's I kind of ended up in the enterprise space a little bit accidentally, um, but it, it grew on me pretty quickly. Um, I had always been interested in writing and publishing. I got very involved in building web communities, and I was just drawn to the enterprise. I think I like the big hairy challenges that the enterprise presented. And I wanted to grapple with that intellectually and try to understand it. Um, I think you and I have are interesting clashes in the sense that we, our roles in the enterprise have been, I think, pretty different over the years. Cause I, I primarily have been a publisher, um, a journalist. Um, sometimes I've ran consulting and training practices, but for the most part, not. Um, but I think we've arrived at a lot of similar conclusions around projects and, um, and, and I think we both don't mind being a little bit out, uh, outspoken about what we've learned, particularly things like the the dangers of customers being over dependent on mega SIs that don't have their best interests at heart, and uh, you know vendor vendors flogging technology that that might really be, if not snake oil, not ready for prime time. Things like that. I think you and I have a lot in common in terms of our desire to have a more practical and perhaps more jugular conversation about what it takes to be successful in this industry. 
Um, but anyway, that eventually found my way to Diginomica with some other cohorts about eight years ago. And we were basically disillusioned with a lot of stuff around how enterprise publishing was done, how enterprise media worked, how the enterprise analyst game worked. And we wanted to try to sort of disrupt that, I guess, by creating our own thing. Um, and uh, we, we've had some good success with, with that. And so we're now eight years in. Um, I will say it still feels like a startup a lot of the time. Some of that's good. Some of that keeps me up at night, but um, but you know I can tell you a little bit more about what the what drives Diginomica, but that's sort of my main undertaking now. Right. Yeah, and that's how a lot of my interaction exposure to your your thought leadership has been through Diginomica, uh, which you're co-founder of, and also uh, Enterprise Irregulars is a. I think that's where I originally you know, first started interacting with you or, or sort of following you yeah. as a thought leader in the space. Um, so tell us, maybe just tell us a little bit about Diginomica for those that don't know, and, and maybe it will help for those that don't know how to spell it and how to find it, but it's D-I-G-I, or I'm sorry, D-I-G-I-N-O-M-I-C-A, so diginomica.com. And, and just to preface it, for those that don't know, it's a really good, uh, I would consider a very good agnostic and pragmatic source for enterprise technology transformation type stuff. I mean, you're, you know, you're, it's very easy to follow. It's very unbiased. Um, and like I said, very practical. You're not sort of up in the clouds uh, like a lot of analysts are speaking foreign languages that don't apply to everyday mm -hmm. uh, realities. But maybe tell us a little, little bit about Diginomica. Why'd you start it? What's the goal of the, of what is it, first of all, and why'd you start it? A couple different reasons. Uh, we started it because we felt that most tech industry um, publications are pretty crap and pretty not in it enterprise focused as well and we felt there was a need to provide um, context to enterprise news um, but one of the big things like the user experience all the big tech sites is just so terrible autoplay videos pop-ups everywhere advertising game chasing eyeballs chasing viral stories we wanted to build a business model that was centered more around providing real practical advice that enterprise customers and people that have a stake in the enterprise can use and um, a big focus of, of Diginomica has been, you know, from the beginning, but really became this notion of, of transformation in the enterprise. And, you know, we're, we're advocates of transformation, but not in the way that vendors sell it. We're advocates of it in the, in the sense that we think that there's a success to be had on the other side of, of the pursuit of transformation in a corporate context, but it's not just technology, it's culture, it's process, it's people, it's everything. And there's a lot of very good reasons for that. Uh, I think uh, people are more and more receptive to that message, obviously. The last year and a half certainly helps uh, in, in that regard, though it's obviously been a tragic circumstance, so it's not something we wanted to happen. But but there is that sense in which, like, um, you know, we, we do need to do business differently if we want to stay agile enough to compete. And so so we really look at that from a large enterprise perspective primarily, and, and that's sort of driven our publication um, since since we started. Right. Yeah. And you guys just put out, you know, massive amounts of content. You cover so much, so many different nooks and crannies of, of the enterprise space. I'm always fascinated by how much you guys, you know, it's, it's not just SAP or Oracle or Microsoft. You're kind of, you're covering the whole spectrum of all types of technologies and implementation, best practices and lessons. And, um, and just keep, I, I read it a lot of times just to keep up to date on what's going on, you know, who bought, you know, what vendor acquired what software and, you know, what's going on with some of the vendors, you guys are really good at covering more of the newsworthy type stuff too, in addition to the more opinionated type stuff. Yeah. And, you know, part, part of our goal is that there's so much noise around stuff. And so we want people to be like, well, if I read just one article to really understand what this news means, then maybe it would be an article from us or we can try to provide some context to that. And that's always the goal. Look, we don't always succeed. I mean, not every article that we publish is brilliant, but, but, but we do try to focus on people who are very experienced and understand the enterprise and and aren't afraid to take a position most of our articles aside from customer stories which we do quite a bit of as well most of our articles have a take it where we where the writer takes a position at the end of the article on what 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 they're seeing and we think that's important to put a stake in as far as what does this mean and what do i think this is a good or bad move and why um we don't pretend to be above the fray uh if you look at our site we are we are uh, our partners include a number of vendors, and some of them we we cover their information. Um, 
we're rigorous about disclosure. We, we think that transparency and, and how you're funded is a really, really big part of things. And so that's a key. Every one of our blog posts has relevant disclosures in it when we do have any vendors that are involved that we do business with. And so, um, you know, we don't pretend to be like better than the business. I mean, everyone in this business is getting paid by someone, but we do try to um, rise above that and also, you know, have strong words even for those that we we do business with. And one thing we tell vendors we work with is that we're still going to criticize you and we're still going to raise points and issues that we think you need to think about because, you know, um, the other thing that is just really important, and this is something that I believe, I think Digenomica as a group believes this too, but this is something I believe very strongly is that not enough pr enterprise projects get across the finish line in a way that we could call successful. I mean, you, you, uh, you've been an expert witness in a lot of situations, so you know how, how wrong these, these products can go when they really go wrong. But I find most projects are actually fairly mediocre and, and don't achieve a lot of the promised benefits. And I think everyone in this industry has a collective responsibility to change that. And so that is a driving focus. Um, but I also think that humor is important too. So if you want to get a flavor for that, I would recommend starting with my weekly Enterprise Hits and Misses column, which is really me at my most unbridled. That comes out every Monday morning. And that's me taking snarky shots at things, but also trying to put the week's Enterprise news in, in context. Yeah, every, every time uh, every time I see that you've tagged me in one of those, and, and I know you've covered something I've written, I always I, I have a moment of flattery, but then I have a moment of fear of like, is what's he going to say though? It might be it might be positive, he might be saying he agrees with me, but there's times where you've put stuff out and you're like, hey, yeah, here's an interesting tape, totally disagree. Here's what I think, you know, which I appreciate. I, yeah. I I like how you you're not afraid to sort of either build on a topic or challenge it or you know provide a, a different perspective, and I, that's why I enjoy reading your stuff and. For those on the live stream here, if you haven't checked out Diginomica, it really is a good source. I mean, it's, uh, like I said, newsworthy, uh, very good opinions. And every article I read from you, there's at least two to three times throughout the read that I will laugh out loud at some of the stuff <laughs> some of the stuff you say. Because some of it is just so honest that it's funny in a way. It's like, I can't believe he's actually saying that. It's absolutely true, but I can't believe he's saying it. Or it's just flat out humor that you're using. Uh, so you have a very unique uh, writing style that I, that I enjoy. So I think others here on the live stream would probably appreciate it too. Um, so you cover a lot of stuff, you, you, you know, you see a lot of, uh, you know, like I said, a lot of vendors, a lot of trends in the market. What are, you know, if you just step back and look at all the stuff you're covering right now, you know, what gets you most excited about the, the space right now? Is there anything that just kind of pops out of you? It's like, Hey, this is a really big deal or maybe a hidden gem of a, a trend or something that's happening out there that mm -hmm. the rest of us aren't really paying attention to, or what, what are some of those things that excite you that's happening out there? Well, I'm excited by two things. One is kind of classic and one is kind of like more new stuff. I mean, the thing that ex excites me in a classic sense is conversations like we're having today where where we can be very informal and like honest about what's really happening in the enterprise. And, and I never get tired of that, like I don't, whether it's a dinner at a trade show or or if you get lucky enough to go to an online event where there actually is a forum for that. Um I think like people putting heads together and like genuinely sharing their experiences and trying to solve problems like to me that that never gets old. But as far as like trends are concerned, I'm I'm a little uh, uh, grouchy with a lot of trend stuff because like when you've been around for a long time, you see like, uh, you know, I always want to know how is this thing different than the last thing? So in other words, like digital transformation, one of my first questions on that was like, I challenge anyone who used that phrase to tell me why it's different than change management because we're using that phrase. Now we're using this new phrase, so why is that different? Um, same thing with AI ops, for example. Okay, that sounds cool, new, and different. Well, how is that different than just workflow automation, for example? Um, so all of that stuff like, like um, really bothers me, and so I'm not like a futurist, which is kind of what you and I were talking about before. Is like I don't like to get tagged by that label because I get really irritated by... You know, for example, uh, so many people got burned by blockchain and spent so much money on blockchain that I don't think they're ever going to see ROI on. Not that it will, it won't eventually mature and have use cases, but it's just one thing. I don't like fanning the hype of stuff. But having said that, I do like what modern enterprise technology is shaping up as because I do think the technology is getting better, and and I think that reinforces some very interesting things. Like for example, this year I've done a couple of stories where you call it low code ERP if you want. Low code doesn't really matter that much as a buzzword, but the idea is basically putting power in the hands of business users to basically automate their own workflows and do stuff without having to go through IT. 
And, and the same thing goes with things like reporting and analytics where there used to be all these IT bottlenecks around all of this type of stuff. And, and, and these days you simply can't afford to wait till the end of the month or the year to get certain kinds of reports or data or to, or to build like a new little app or something. And the more I see business users being able to take that power in their own hands, the more excited I get about where enterprise software could ultimately wind up as because so far it really hasn't gotten there as much as the marketing folks would have you believe. But that's what kind of gets me excited is seeing business users truly engaged. Yeah, that's that's super interesting in, in use or taking the power back almost, you know, t taking the power back from IT and, and also taking the power back from uh, consultants or system integrators. I mean, because a lot of times these companies, they get so dependent on the big SIs or outside consultants that they can't function without them because they, they just have this black hole of lack of knowledge that the SI or the consultants have. But now we're kind of shifting that to make it to where you don't necessarily need that level of outside support. I totally agree. And, and, and in case people think I'm kind of like criticizing I, IT and, and kind of and, and casting a negative light on IT, I'm not at all. In fact, I think I just did a use case about a, a CIO who is really looks like he's really going to be able to deliver for the business in the medical industry with with their vision of more connected care for patients, which is a really good thing for everyone. And, and, and this CIO is getting much more engaged with business outcomes because he feels he has the technology to deliver on that. And like to me, I actually get depressed when I run into companies that don't have any IT. Now, granted, there are some startups that have a cloud first thing and they got to move fast. They don't want to build IT. But in general, I like IT as a differentiator. I like the idea of, of people in IT working on differentiated projects, embedding uh, their their technology into smart devices or, or, or building customer-facing apps or doing really cool stuff that impacts their business. I, I love that vision of IT. I just don't like the vision of IT as like, and of course, security and compliance, all that stuff matters also. But I just don't like that vision of IT as like the bottleneck that prevents business users from getting things done. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it also, you know, forces the business users to connect the dots between the technolo technological needs and what those business needs are. Totally. And they're, they're best equipped to do that for sure. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. What about, um, maybe let, let me go the opposite direction of what I just asked you and talk about what are those trends or buzzwords that you think right now are, are the most overhyped or that an enterprise technology buyer should be the most leery of? I know you mentioned blockchain a little bit, but what, what are some of your thoughts there? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of these buzzwords do represent topics that are worth reckoning with. It's just you have to be wary about immediately opening up your wallet and feeling like you can't be successful without it. Um, one that gets a lot of debate right now is customer data platforms. That's huge on the, on the CX side. Um, and so the question then becomes like, is this new and different than the, than the data integration activities we've undertaken in the past? Um, you know, and, and so you need to really take a hard look at that and we'll, will we get a better result like um you know integrating all your customer data sounds wonderful but then think about well what about our finance data and what about the rest of our corporate data that we may need visibility into our supply chain data how can you serve customers if you don't have visibility into your supply chain so these 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 acronyms like cdp you have to be really really careful when event when vendors start glomming on to that because they're doing it partially because they're going to sell sell a bunch of stuff to you um, you know, I think we have to be really careful with AI. Um, 
there's all kinds of problems with AI. Um, a lot of AI tools ship uh, in problematic ways that perhaps include um, biases. We see that a ton in HR. You do a search on AR, AI recruitment controversy and you'll find all kinds of stuff around companies that tried AI tools for recruiting and found that they were actually screening qualified applicants or not including diverse applicants for various reasons. So there's there's always an underbelly to these technologies. It doesn't mean that they're bad. It just means they deserve a, a close, uh, close look. So I, I don't know that I would say any of them. I mean, blockchain is a little bit of a special case because it was so hyped when there were just no use cases. And I'm still waiting to do my first live production scale enterprise blockchain story. <laughs> I keep right. telling vendors like, please send me your 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 live production story. Nope, but we've got this great POC, which is proof of concept. Um, well, we've been doing POCs in blockchain now for five or six years. Um, and so that, you know, that's that's obviously technology that I get a little particularly wary of just because, you know, the, the use cases aren't there yet. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to look at it. I think uh, I agree with you, by the way. I think there's so many cool technologies out there and blockchain is one of them, but you, you have to take it all with a grain of salt and recognize it even if you do commit to a certain technology, whether it's a, a type of technology or even a certain vendor or, or a certain specific uh, software solution there's always an underbelly to it, like you said. And I think that's true for any any solution out there, for sure. Um, we're getting a few comments or questions here um, from the audience, so maybe I'll jump in here. Uh, first is a comment that it's worth noting here, and you alluded to this a minute ago, John, but um, Greg mentions here that John owns Cloud ERP Friday afternoons here on LinkedIn. <laughs> so so we'll plug for your, you have a show that you do on- Oh, on yeah, yeah, yeah. That's It's usually at 4 Eastern, though. I'm probably not gonna do it today because I wanted to, focus on this show so but but yeah usually fridays at 4 4 30 have kind of a blowout it's not always about cloud erp though i do a fair amount of cx stuff mostly i just interview independent thinkers in the enterprise and see where the conversations go it's it's not unlike this format so very cool okay well yeah we'll be sure to check that out uh, for the audience there um another comment that uh uh, I've dropped a few comments on Diginomica over the years, all taken in good stride. So another another fan of your your publication there or your your outlet there. Uh, yeah, here's a question: What are the what are the API integration best practices for before, during, or after implementation, provided that the client has a, quite a few best of breed systems? So that's a very specific question. We're we're, we're jumping right in here, going going to go straight into wow. the weeds. With the API integration. <laughs> I don't know. That's, uh, <laughs> that's well, not it's a actually really. Problem, I'm glad you brought. The, I'm glad you raised that. And what's one interesting thing, just by the way, is I was going to say another buzzword. I'm very wary of is multi-cloud, and and I was just discussing this the other day and how I like the idea of multi-cloud environments, but the problem becomes that um, that the tools to allow customers to easily move workloads between clouds just haven't delivered on the multi-cloud promise. So that's one I'm I would advise being very wary of as a term. But the idea of like avoiding lock-in is always a really good discussion to have. As far as APIs are concerned, I mean, the the, the thing about a APIs is that they are a step forward from classic point-to-point -point integration. But um, you do need to be conversing with the vendors that are responsible providing, for providing those APIs and understanding what the impact of it is is and also your technology team not all apis are created equal some of them are more robust and have more business content and are more readily usable others will get you into trouble if you don't have certain standard configurations and i know you cover this a lot in your blog but if you get over customized even and you can do this even with cloud software sometimes it can affect those api integrations going forward one of the biggest things you need to you need to ask about with with the vendors around apis is you know what is the testing going to go look like with these APIs going forward? Could they break? If so, how? And and because just because an API works today doesn't mean it's going to work three months from now when a, when a number of vendors have up, updated their software or a year from now, likewise. So I think the biggest thing about APIs is to realize that they're not some magic solution. And in fact, like I believe that if certain vendors work very closely together, on a lot of projects that they need to go need to go beyond APIs and provide a, a deeper level of, of of sophisticated integration. One one good example of that would be Salesforce, just because they are a partner of ours. So take it for what that's worth. But but 
so many so many customers want to integrate whatever they're doing with Salesforce, especially like in the ERP space or whatever. Um, so I think it's very important to ask about what kind of dedicated integration you have and what the relationships are between those vendors. Do those vendors talk to each other at all around their API strategies and their integration strategies? So, I mean, I'm not, I've never been on an API project, so you have to take that with a grain of salt, but those are the kinds of questions I'd be asking. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I, no, I, I think it's absolutely true. And especially in today's day and age where I think that whole best of breed concept is becoming more acceptable and more common. You know, 10, 20 years ago, it was almost a bad word to say, you know, I'm going to have two or three or four different systems and tie them all together. But now the, the tools are generally flexible enough and the architectures are open enough that you can you can do that more realistically. But, you know, you still have to make sure it's all going to work together and that you've clearly defined your data strategy and you, you understand where the data is going to reside and how you're going to manage that master data, where you're going to manage it. So there's just a lot of variables that need to be addressed, but not to say you shouldn't do it. It's just a back to the point of the underbelly or the risks, you know, you've got to, you've got to be able to manage those pieces. As Beware well. of seamless integration folks. Yes. Seamless yeah. integration. That is one of the phrases that always scares me. Yeah. And it, you know, I, it, I had a call with a client this morning actually, who is uh, a customer of, of SAP as for HANA, a space that I know, you know, uh, very well as well. And, and, and we both have histories with, uh, being in the SAP world early in our careers or earlier in our careers. Um, but they, he had talked about how um, with SAP, it's actually easier in his opinion, it's easier to integrate non SAP products than it is to integrate SAP's own products to each other, which I thought was super interesting comment. Ouch. Yeah. So I thought, well, that that's because you would assume, you know, if I'm buying a bunch of stuff from one vendor, it's going to seamlessly integrate. Right. I mean, it makes sense. You, you would think, but then you get into the reality of it and it doesn't quite work that way. Well, right. Uh, we could have a discussion about acquired pro products and how that changes that. But yes, with the Reba and Concur and all the acquisitions they've they've done in particular. So, Eric, I wanted to mention to you, uh, you're you're kind of guiding our question flow, so you can decide where you want to take this. But I did prepare some unique content for your audience in your show. What I did, yes. I you write a lot about project success and how to achieve it. So, what I did is I came up with my underrated keys to project success. That, that I believe don't get enough airtime. And yes. I thought you might enjoy hearing them uh, because it might clash with some of yours and be kind of fun. So I prepared, I think, about eight of them. I don't have an exact count because some of them are kind of related to each other. But anyway, yeah, I got them. So whenever you want to hit them, I've got them for you. Let's let's jump so, into it because I think that'll stimulate. And, and I'm excited too because I have no idea what's on your list, which is great. You do and not. Then, uh, and I want to hear what uh, the audience has to say too. So I'll kind of watch, you know, I think it'll probably stimulate uh, more questions and comments. So yeah, please fire away your, your top eight or 10 or however many it is uh, cool. underrated keys to, to success. Yeah. Well, well, let me preface this by just quickly saying that a lot of the keys to project success you read about on Eric's blog, for example, are, are pretty, I don't want to say they're, they're mundane, but they're not sexy, but they're just, they just are true. Things like executive buy-in, uh, change management is a theme that you hit all the time. That's obviously a, a given training. For example, companies continue to uh, chronically underinvest in, in training. Um, and, and when you look at why products fall short, it's often like a real key to why, why they did. And so there are things like that that are, that are there um, that, that I'm not going to mention today just because, they're obvious, they're important though, but but they're just not that much fun to talk about because <laughs> we keep talking about them. You're right. Um, but they're, but then the, they're, there's some newer ones that are kind of important that I'm not going to get into as well, but they have to do with the fact that a lot of these multi-year products now, you could have a multi-year transformation project, but it, I don't believe you're going to see it through unless you have so-called quick wins. So one of the big jobs of today's products is figuring out what those quicker wins are going to look like. That that has to be put into place as part of this, um, and 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 then, but the quick wins have to tie into an overall platform strategy. So, in other words, the other mistake companies have made, and this I've seen it in the pandemic as well, is roll out an app quickly to customers because you need to have a direct to customer app, but you didn't think about what happens when I build ten more apps, like, and I have ten of them. They need to be really on the same platform and be sharing the same design characteristics probably. But did you think through that? And with data platforms, it's the same because more and more this is about information and data and not just transactional systems. So you have to have a data platform 
strategy as well. But I think a lot of that is all like understood. I'm not going to sit here and say it's easy. I think that's understood. The other one I think that's understood is that you have to be able to know how you're going to measure your your success. And so I think more and more attention is being paid and, and rightly so to what are the metrics by which we judge these outcomes. And the metrics need to be much more business oriented than they were in the past. So not just, oh, we got off of these legacy systems and now we're processing more transaction per second. Who cares? Are you getting close to your customer? Are you getting closer to your suppliers? All that kind of stuff. So, so that's all sort of the understood stuff. So let me get to the stuff that I think is like more um, underrated stuff. Um, sure. I believe a lot of this comes down to the what I call the paradox of customer ownership, which is that successful projects require more customer ownership over the outcome of those projects and less what I would call sort of trust in the SI. I was going to say blind faith, but that's not entirely fair, but less trust in the SI. A lot of times the the, the external partners get in there um, because they've been in there for a long time and they've built the relationships up and it's kind of a given. And I kind of reject that. I think you need to step back from that a little bit. Um, software selection is rarely the reason a pro pro project goes wrong, but you do have to choose the right software. Um, yeah. But, but, but the thing I would say, the first underrated key is picking the right partner and, and, and that has an industry component to me. So you need someone who understands your industry and, and that's why the generic SI thing I'm skeptical of because a lot of times I think the, the best SI or partner for your project may not be a large SI. Maybe it is, but it's got to be people that understand your industry and, and can speak to you about what other customers in your industry are doing, how they're winning, where they're going wrong. If they can't have that conversation with you, I don't care how well they know your software, they won't be able to help you. The, these, these generic software categories like ERP and CRM, they are not going to be generic categories in five years. I can tell you, even in the CRM world, they're talking about industry now and, and how do we create customer uh, management, customer experience applications that fit a particular industry situation. So you need partners that understand your industry. So that's 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 my top key. Right. It's a good one. Do you want to comment on that before I move into a few others? or? No, I just think, I think it's a great point. I mean, I think too many companies get enamored by a name, you know, it's Accenture, it's Deloitte, it's IBM, whoever. Um, and I, I, the saying that drives me crazy is no one ever got fired for hiring IBM or Accenture or Deloitte, except I can name a ton of people that have been fired for hiring one of them. <laughs> that's, that's the caveat. Yeah. To that. Or, and, and wound up in, in court, like in, in various lawsuits that you've served as an expert witness on as well. And, and look, yeah. there are some great um, teams and larger SIs as well. So I'm not just going to sit here and trash that. It's yeah. more, but I think you have to look more experienced than the name. And, and make sure that, that those you engage with are the ones who are actually going to be seeing your project through and, and, and on the ground with you, quote unquote, even if they're not on the ground per se, they may not be on the ground, but you know what I mean. Um, my no next who, one. I just yeah, add, no yeah, matter, yeah. No matter who it is, uh, even if it's a great fit, who, whether, whether it's a big SI or not, you still have to manage those consultants. I mean, it's your project and you still have to own it. So I think that's the other thing too, is don't assume that just because you found the right one, that now your your work here is done. They're going to take it from here. You still have to work very closely with them and collaborate and have the right controls in place and all that stuff. So, my next one is I look for I look for signs of struggle in the customer partner relationship, and by that I mean I I, I want to when I do interviews and such, I want to hear about the hard times. I don't care mm -hmm. what project you have, if you didn't have a hard time in a moment of truth or two on that project, I don't buy your success. And, and I'm looking for partners that are not perfect and have these perfect rosy stories. I'm looking for stories of how we had a gut punch and how we came together and overcame it. That's what I want to hear about. And I don't hear enough of those stories, but that's what I look for. And, and when I see really successful projects, that's what I see is I see a relationship between the, the customer, the vendor, the partner that have all been tested and they've seen it through. And that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, that's a great one. And it gets back to the point of every every decision, whether it's a which consulting partner, which vendor, or which product you use, or whatever it may be. There's always a dark side to it, or there's always some sort of risk, or some sort of uh, uh, not a failure point, but mistake. You know, like in the case of consultants, where have they made mistakes? Where have the challenges been with the project? And if you're not picking up on that, then you're missing something because it, it's there. You just have to understand what they are. Bingo. And, and a lot of the rest of mine kind of fall into a general category, which is 
that I have a lot more confidence and hear a lot more good things with customers that, that the way I put it is they come up for air more often. So in other words, they're not heads down all the time focused on themselves. They have context. They have context of what their peers are doing. They have context to what the industry are doing. They enjoy debating trends with, with analysts and bloggers and people like yourself. Um, so there are different components to that. I look for, for example, it's a cultural thing, right? In the sense that there are some companies that really don't encourage or provide budget for their employees to do these things. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I think a lot of them are ultimately self-defeating. Some of the reasons are, oh my gosh, like if, if we give our employees all these networking and immersion opportunities and send them to conferences and stuff, they'll meet other employers and they'll get hired away from us. And so like, let's, let's be insular, um, but it always fails in the end. And, and mm -hmm. so I look for things like active user group involvement. Um, I look for people who are always out there networking on LinkedIn and elsewhere, asking questions in product forums, getting information. Um, that kind of stuff is so invaluable. When I see customers talking together at trade shows and swapping war stories, I sit here and say, gosh, every minute of this is worth thousands of dollars of consulting time. What they're bringing home to their team from these conversations gives them such huge perspective. So many of the problems that we run into on projects are because we're not getting regular infusions of good information that, that make us all more, uh, you know, understanding of what is really happening and how to get a good result. So a lot of things fall into that category. Um, and, and I'll add another one to it, but I'll see if you have a comment on that. Yeah, I, I think it's a great point. I mean, I, as a consultant, and it's easy to think that, you know, people are just going to want to come to you to get the answers and, and get the advice. But I think, you know, when we do our events, like our live events or virtual events, um, it, it's just as I think there's just as much value to people attending those getting uh, information from each other and just learning from each other's mistakes and war stories as it is hearing it from a consultant. And I think in some ways, a lot of ways, actually, your peers are going to be a lot more credible because they're you can relate to them better than you could a consultant who's an outsider, you know, looking in. But if you're dealing with a peer who's sitting in your exact same seat and they've made some mistakes, maybe they've done some things right that you can learn from that's that's pretty invaluable and it's it uh that tends to stick just as well if not better sometimes than consulting advice so I, I totally agree with you on that the next one's a really big one for me and i have a whole series on digitonomica i've written about this i think i you might i think i might even have a piece about you in this series i'll have to check um i'll check it out but it's it's the importance of independent advisors and in, in project results and Independent advisors can fit all kinds of different flavors, um, but but what it comes down to is that whoever you select for your prime partner should have some level of accountability at various points. That could be independent subject matter experts who come in on a consulting basis. It could be people who participate in software evaluation. It could be people who do software audits and maturity checks. There's all kinds of flavors of, of, of independence, and it's very, very important to integrate their voices into what it is you do and there are objections to this that i hear and the biggest one is oh well that's a political minefield and it makes things so much more complicated and the the main prime vendor is threatened by this and it will you know perhaps all of those things are true but you still have to do it because mm -hmm. otherwise you're putting too much stock in one vested interest or two to make sure that this goes a certain way and you, you can't afford that. These products are too important. So sorry, but you have to learn how to manage the politics of it. Yeah. And I would almost argue, is it really politics or is it that you're call you have a party there that's calling out the elephant in the room, which is there's a problem or here's a risk and we need to deal with it versus no, 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 let's just shove that under the rug and not deal with it. So you could call that political, but in my view, it's like, yeah, it's sort of politics. It does get into some politics, but I think it's because it's, it's somewhat of a threat sometimes to the SI. I know for us, a lot of times, I know a lot of system integrators don't want us involved. Um, and, and it's not because we don't know what we're doing. Exactly. It's because we, we create a level of accountability and we expose risks. And, and that's what you should do anyway. Not because you want to point fingers or assign blame. It's not about that. It's just these projects are messy. And if you're not feeling like it's messy, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you know, you're, you're missing something if you don't get into the messiness of it. So you might as well just draw the messiness out, tackle it, deal with it, clean it up as you're going, rather than brushing it under the rug and then 
post go live, you know, you find that you can't function your business because you didn't deal with any of these things. Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, I mean, in, in good, healthy product environments, it shouldn't be politics because your, your partner should welcome that. And that should be part of when you select a partner, you should be very upfront with them that even though we're going to really put our trust in you for this project, we're going to have other people involved that are going to provide input in various points. And, you know, a, a good project environment, people welcome that kind of openness and, and, and appreciate like the informed judgment of experts because the independents that come in are not coming in like to screw up your project. They're coming in to provide valuable perspective. And so ideally right. to your point, those politics shouldn't be there, but I just wanted to acknowledge it because I do want to acknowledge that I do think it does require a little more finesse to manage, but I think the payoff is just so huge if you can figure out how to do it. So. Yeah. And, and the other thing too is, you know, you were talking about, um, I can't remember if it's before or after we started the live stream and we were talking a little bit before we went live. Uh, but at one point here today, we were talking about how um, uh, people need to sort of take control back uh, from their, of, of their project and not necessarily um, just view it as an IT project. We're sort of talking about that whole technology versus business mm -hmm. piece of it. And when you have an independent advisor, you, you, well, let me back up. When you have a, a software vendor, a big SI that's managing everything and you have no other counter opinions in there, you're going to view everything or they're going to view everything as sort of a technology first. Like if I'm an SAP integrator, let's figure out how SAP is going to fit in here. Well, there's a lot of places yep. where SAP doesn't belong there. I mean, you can still be using SAP, but you don't need to be using it for everything. You don't need to buy every single module out there or you exactly. know, deploy it to the organization. So those are the types of decisions that happen throughout an implementation that, to your point, might be perceived as political, but it's, I think, just asking good questions and challenging you know, the status quo in a, in a good way that's going to help you longer term. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was just digging out the, uh, like, I can't remember if I, I think the piece I did on you is is in here, but if it's not, I will correct that after the uh, the chat here, but I'll, I'll paste it into the Crowdcast. This is just a collection of those articles on independence. Um, then then the next thing is, um, I have two more, so this is the second to last, is, is health checks, which is the other part of coming up for air is, you know, you need you need some form of health checks on on your project on a on a much more regular basis, and so how that works is up to you. Um, I'm finding that increasingly there's companies that will offer those to you, and 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 come in periodically to to do some kind of a project health check. And you know I'm not gonna like name a bunch of names now because I don't want to like do a big advertisement for companies, but there are they are out there. You can contact me offline or perhaps Eric if you want to learn more about that, but. But to me, that's, I, I know that it's kind of like, well, it's almost seems like a dental appointment. And so I, I know that companies who do these health checks do find some resistance from some companies because sometimes it's like, just kind of like a dental appointment where it's like, oh, you might have a cavity over here. Like, well, that's not always the, the news you want to hear at that moment in time. But when you look back on it, you're like, man, I'm really gl glad I got on top of that. And so coming up for air more often includes a formalized health check that could take stock of various aspects of your project, whether it's project morale or timeline versus actual goals or whatever it is. Right. That's, that's a good one. And it, you know, you, you coming up for air is an important uh, concept. You know, you want, you want to be able to see the forest for the trees and it's so easy to get down in the weeds and get all tangled up and all the details of how the system is going to get designed and built and tested and all that stuff. I think companies need to back up every so often and just sort of look at the, the lay of the land and see where the risks are, where the landmines are and start to navigate those better. Yeah, absolutely. Especially because there can be big leadership changes. You could have a CEO turnover, you could have an acquisition pending. There's all kinds of things that can change roadmaps and change goals. And if your business goals change, then your projects have to change. So all of that requires much more adaptable thing. And then, and then the final thing, which could be a whole show unto itself is my very firm belief that, that, that for the most part, go live is just the beginning of extracting benefits from projects. The idea originally came from my now past partner, Michael Doan, uh, who I wrote a book with back in the day, but he had developed a lot of maturity models in the ERP and SAP environment to help companies think about how you thrive after go live is how he put it. Um, but the same is true for modern software. I've written some pieces on cloud ERP benefits and how I'm very struck by the fact that 
a lot of customers get so excited about their go live because they got off all these legacy systems and they 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 integrated a bunch of databases they rolled it out to new regions all this stuff the software is more user friendly than their old stuff they think that's the end of it but in fact that's just the beginning and and there's so much more that is possible but you you have to work at it and i could go into all kinds of things whether it's um you know automating workflows and creating the possibility to automate workflows or whether it's uh you know dashboards and reporting and alerts infrastructures whether it's uh new you know predictive technologies that, that gets layered on top of 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 your core systems or whatever it is but i've kind of outlined a whole framework for that because there's so much more that can happen after go live and unfortunately the reality is that if you if you just kind of do your thing you won't achieve those benefits they don't just suddenly magically happen yeah. it requires uh in fact in one of my articles on cloud erp that i'm just going to read this very short sentence to you uh i say th in this case i'm talking about cloud erp but it doesn't have to be erp systems despite the benefits of moving to modern erp many cloud erp gains don't seem to come until well after go live extracting full value from cloud erp is not about flipping the go live switch it requires organizational will and a fierce collaboration with the vendor and our consulting partner and i go on to say i don't care whether you call it digital transformation or business model evolution or agility or whatever the hell you want to call it the point is you have to work for it it's not going to land in your lap yeah yeah that's a great point and, and one thing that's always fascinated me about these sorts of projects and the, and the way organizations think about these projects is you spend all this time and money just massive amounts of time and money to to implement and get to go live but they don't spend that extra little time it takes to just no fine tune it and yeah and it's not a lot of effort i mean it's it in fact i would argue the highest roi you're going to get on any activity in your entire project is going to be that those little things you do after Bingo. go live and it's it's just fascinating to me it's like you you went through all that heartache and pain and budget budget overruns and all that stuff but you won't go that extra little mile to get some real value out of it i mean that's where you and they're usually little things too it's a lot of times it's like you know, our, oh, we have a work group over here that's not trained in the system or they just are using it wrong. And if we just got them to use it the right way, the way it's meant to be used, you know, we could deliver X amount of value. So it's, you know, identifying that laundry list of things that you could be doing, prioritizing based on value and then going out and deploying just minor modifications to it. So I totally agree with you on that. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's my list. That is a, if we that's have any an awesome audience, list. audience questions or additions, I probably, I missed a few good ones, but that's what I prepared. So if anyone yeah. has any good ones that they like, feel free to throw them into the chat. I'd love to see because at some point I'll write a new piece on this and I'll try to bring a lot of this discussion into it. So, yeah, yeah, I'd love to hear the audience too in terms of what what they might be, you know, what people think you missed or what they would add to the list, um, and or and or if you agree or disagree with anything, that'd be great to hear too. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, Contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. There's a bunch of comments and questions coming in here from the audience. Um, Here's one I'll, I'll cover here with you, uh, John, see what you think. Um, isn't that a norm in big ERP projects to call on independent advisors during the realization phase? If only it was. <laughs> it, it, it should be. Yeah. Uh, Eric, you, you do a lot of this work. Do you find that to be the norm? No, it's not the norm. I mean, obviously, the clients that hire us, it's the norm. It's what they do. But, uh, but it, what, what amazes me, though, is with... I'd say the overwhelming majority of expert witness cases where there's a lawsuit and you know a project has failed and they bring us in as expert witnesses or in cases where it's not a lawsuit but it's a project failure or a struggling project and they hire us to come in and clean it up 
in an overwhelming number of those cases, there was no independent voice of reason. And so they sort of, the organizations yep. get led astray down a path that doesn't necessarily make sense for them. And they don't know how to get off that path because they don't know any better. They don't know what questions to ask or how to, how to redirect or if they should redirect. And so, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say, no, it's not the norm, but I would agree it should be. And that's the whole reason I started the company that I started. I guess I would say, if you think that's the norm, you have, a, you're probably working for a good organization and you should probably yes. stay with that company <laughs> and congr congratulations for that. That's, that's <laughs> Any other great. questions? Yeah. Um, how about this? this is getting into a little bit of change management stuff here, but what are the musts in the communication plan during implementation? So what are the things we must communicate in our communication plan during a implementation mm. or transformation? I, I really like that one because I do think companies, I'll be interested to hear your view on this because I would definitely defer to you on change management. But, but my view is where companies can sometimes make a mistake is they can talk too much about how this is going to help the company. I do think that's important because we want the company to survive, but not enough about what the benefits are going to be for you. Um, and so, so what I'm looking for is more role-based information on how is this going to make your, the, you, the user, your daily life better? Because if, if, if it's going to help my company, but my job is going to suck for three months, Mm, that's not so great. And and I, the other thing I'm really looking for is some real transparency around, okay, this is difficult. You're not going to necessarily enjoy all aspects of what's new. <laughs> we tried to incorporate your changes, you know, so in other words, the input's in there, um, but we weren't able to do all of them. We have to, in, in, in many cases in these bigger projects, we had to go back to standard functionality in certain ways. You know, so you have to explain why you made those decisions. So I think that transparency around all of that stuff is is really important to to get buy in. But the thing is, if you bring that communications plan in, you, you better have had input from those users long before that plan was ever written. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the, I don't care what you say; it's not going to go over. You should have gotten their input from the beginning. A lot of a lot of times, these these line of business users will have better ideas than you do about how to use the software. So, yeah, and. I totally agree with that. And and there's a lot of situations that we see where you've got a great change team in place. You've got very capable people that can handle the communication piece of it. And it's actually not the, oftentimes it's not the communications itself that's the problem. It's that the organization doesn't take the time up front to define what the organization is going to look like and how the, how the changes are going to be realized. So, you know, for example, to your point about a job sucking for an individual, but allegedly it's going to be great for the organization. You think about, um, we're seeing this a lot with like AI and machine learning. And you build a business case that shows that, you know, John Reed now is going to save, you know, 60% of his job is going to be automated. So now he can spend more time doing other stuff. And so then you hand that off to the communication team and say, okay, there's there, there's the impact to John Reed's uh, job. And what are you going to communicate? I mean, you're going to communicate that your, your job's getting automated, but you don't have anything good beyond that. Like, well, what are you going to do with that time that now gets automated? And now suddenly you're creating more fear and you're actually perpetuating, a, you know, you're, you're creating resistance by communicating what's been, you know, what you've been tasked to communicate. So a lot of times you see that the communication and change efforts actually backfire, not because they're not good at it, but because the, the vision hasn't been set for what John's job is going to look like and what he's going to do with that 60% of his time that now is supposedly going to be automated. Oh man, I love that point you raised too, because there is still a lot of fear around automation and what that means for my job and my work. And, you know, the good news is that we're seeing in a lot of cases that 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 because of labor shortages and things like that, that when companies automate, they actually do need those existing personnel to to perform hopefully even more engaging work because it's not as repetitive. Like a lot of the work that gets automated is the more repetitive mundane parts. And so hopefully it's the more interesting parts, whether it's custom customer facing stuff or more sophisticated shop floor stuff or whatever it is. But the one thing I would say is that headcounts do come along headcount reductions do come along with some of these projects and and to pretend otherwise is totally disingenuous and yeah. and if you do have a headcount reduction that does need to be communicated openly as part of this exercise and to be able to say look we do have to we don't want to but this is the situation um but 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 then on a personal level everyone who's staying on you say look we did have to let these people go but you're staying your job is changing, but you're staying. And here's the opportunity to your point that you're going to have. Um, and I think most people will embrace those opportunities, but but it, it, you have to be 
right you fair about how you describe them because otherwise they're not going to use your software i mean salespeople are the classic example because salespeople, especially the good ones getting them to enter the data that you want to put into the system you know to, to make your ai better and to make your analytics better have fun with that if they don't like using your system and it doesn't help them make more sales they're not using your system you can't force them to use i don't care you're not gonna be able to force them to use it they'll just go somewhere else they'll take another job so i, I love looking at sales and change management because that's a classic example of why god we need the data in those sales people's heads well how are you going to do that without losing your top sales people you're going to do it by showing them they're going to make even more money in the new setup otherwise forget it yeah, exactly. It can't just be an administrative task that they're doing for a greater good. You need to tie it to you're going to actually make more money this way. That's a good, yep. good point. Um, here's a great question from uh, uh, Frank Scavo. I think you know him, don't you? I, oh, yeah, Frank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, Frank, so how you doing? <laughs> it's good to see you too, Frank. Uh, hi, Eric. Good to see you. Uh, would you say that many companies are so worn out by the go live that they don't follow through to do that additional part to layer on the real value added capabilities? It's a loaded question. I'll, I'll leave it to you to take the first pass at that. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to hear your answer to that too. Yeah, um, I think I think sometimes the go live push can be exhausting, but eventually people do recover from that. the The problem is that they they kind of lose focus on what's possible, and sometimes their partners move on to whatever's next as well, and don't look at some of these higher level benefits, which are. A little take a little more effort to achieve like in in my thing i talk about different stages of benefits so i talk about things like um the impact of data visibility in a single source of truth um i i talk about um you know uh setting up intelligent alert systems and anomaly detection i talk about platform benefits and and how to build on additional industry apps to your core things like that uh researching future innovations provided by the vendor on a more regular basis, figuring out how to, all those things just require organizational energy and resources. But I, I think Frank's right that, that right after go live, you can have this big exhale. I'm not so sure that's a bad thing, but there has to be an awareness that now you got to come back to it. And this is, you know, we, we talk about this notion of customer success, but it also applies to our own projects. Like we got to keep working at it because our business model is never un a done thing we have to keep improving it and the software is meant to help us with that but we can't stop yeah know? yeah and yeah i also have to get to the root cause of to frank's question about why are people so worn out i mean i know these projects are tough i you know you and i've been mm. through them. a lot of us on the call have been through them but you think about you know they're, they're tough yes they're tough to begin with they're inherently tough but i think a lot of times we make them a lot harder than they need to be partly because we go in with these unrealistic expectations of you know, that 18 month global rollout of SAP, you know, to 5,000 people. I mean, it's, it's not going to happen in 18 months, but you're going to kill yourself trying to do it in 18 months. It's going to end up taking 24 or 36 or whatever. And you're going to be absolutely exhausted by the end, to Frank's point. But did you need to be? I mean, that, and that's, so that's the question of if you just planned for a 24 or 36 month rollout or whatever it is, and you just had that burn rate and that tempo set, and it's a more realistic tempo, then you, yes, you're going to be tired. It's going to be hard, but you at least aren't so exhausted that you just move on. I think companies get to the point of like, hey, let's just cut our losses. Let's just stop the bleeding and stop this project. And they don't want to spend any more time on that value realization. Yeah, good point. Yeah, it's a really good question too. I like that one. Um, Alice, uh, take one more question here and then we'll, we'll be uh, here toward the end of our, our time slot here. But um, this is a great one. I, I love this concept or this question, but do you think that user companies should build a sort of center of excellence for their post ERP implementation life or still be dependent on consultants to run their systems? Another great question. I, I love the question. Um, and I think I actually had centers of excellence on the list. So this audience member is, is definitely rocking it. Um, the <laughs> thing is one of the reasons I didn't do it is because I started to feel like it maybe it was a little more on the obvious side and I wanted to do more underrated um, I, there are a lot of companies that don't have centers of excellence. I, I do think that uh, that it's an important aspect of ownership to think about how you cultivate internal skills. Now, look, you're not going to necessarily cultivate internal skills on every in every area of technology, so you won't necessarily have a center of excellence for everything. Um, you know, I'm generally a big fan of center of excellence for the areas that you're really taking ownership of, like whether it's ERP or, or CRM, or maybe it's BI is another really good one, I think, to have a center of excellence around. AI would be a good example of a problematic one. 
you have to really look hard at whether you're going to invest in a data science team and cultivate that team uh, internally. Larger companies will, but what if you're based in a more obscure location where it's hard to re get people to relocate and that's important to you or or, or, or what if you have a hard time holding on to these people? Maybe that's not the right COE for you, and maybe you're going to have more external support around those concepts. So you have to make those decisions. But the one thing I would caution around the COE is I think sometimes it can become a little bland. And like even when you say it, it sounds kind of bland. And, and I think you got to start thinking about how a COE also – doesn't just isn't just a skill building exercise but actively contributes to some business result hank barnes at gartner wrote a really interesting post a while back it was short like a lot of his posts are so it left me hanging a little bit but he talked about what if we switch center of excellence to center of innovation and and i i'm not a huge fan of the word innovation because it's so flogged it almost lost meaning but like i like that shift a little bit right like how do we turn these into energizing activities that aren't just about filling skills gaps, but developing, you know, new ideas that can really help the business. I think if you do that, then I think it can be a very powerful concept. Yeah. And constantly looking for ways to improve and leverage, selectively leverage new technologies and, you know, deploying those to your organization. And, you know, I tie it back to a comment you made earlier. Again, I think this might've been before we went live today, um, but you, you were talking about low code ERP um, yeah. and how the users are becoming more self self-sustained or self-reliant yep. and, and less dependent on IT with that movement toward, you know, technology becoming more user friendly and easier to manage it from the business side. I think that whole center of excellence concepts becomes a little more realistic. You know, it's a little bit more doable now because you have technology that isn't so complicated that you have to have this robust, sophisticated IT support function. It can be more of a, a business user support function. Um, so I, I think that's a great point. Indeed. Indeed, absolutely. Good, good audience questions. People are on their on their game out there. Yeah, some really good questions. Um, yeah, I feel like we could go for another hour, so I, I'm definitely going to have to have you back on the show. So cool. I appreciate you, appreciate you being here today. I really appreciate all the thought you put into your your top uh, your top keys. Absolutely. To under the you know, top underrated keys to success. I love that concept, and uh, I might have to borrow some of that for a blog or something. Yeah, so. feel free. Cool. Awesome. It was a pleasure. Good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for all the good questions, everyone. It was a fun yeah, time. thank you. Yeah, thank you for all the audience questions. Thank you for being here, John. Diginomica.com. Check it out. It's a great uh, article. Subscribe to the, the email, to that weekly email that goes out that hits and misses is awesome because it's just a summary Thanks. of all the, all the stuff. So I encourage people to subscribe to that. Okay, well, thank you, Jonathan, for being on the show today. Great discussion. I'm excited to unpack some of those topics a little bit more with Parisa and Kyler. We're going to take a quick break, and we will uh, unpack those topics a little bit more here in just a few minutes. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm here with Parisa Noble and Kyler Cheatham. Um, you can find Transformation Ground Control, by the way, every Wednesday morning, U.S. time. Um, you can find us on YouTube. We premiere um, every Wednesday morning at uh, 10 a.m. Eastern time in the United States on YouTube. You can also find us at that same time uh, forward every Wednesday morning on all your podcast platforms of choice, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, whatever Whatever you listen to podcasts on, check us out there. Be sure to subscribe and share this podcast if you don't mind. We're trying to get more audience members and get, we're trying to get the word out. So if there's any colleagues or people you work with you think might be interested, we'd love to have you share the, the content with them. So 
Getting back to this uh, interview we had with John Reed from Diginomica, what were some of your thoughts, Parisa, having heard what, what he had to say and just some of his perspective on the industry? Yeah, he seems like a cool guy, John Reed. I'd, I'd like to sit down and pick his brain a little more, but I loved how he said he's grouchy with trends because I can get behind that. I feel like in any trend, whether it's in the industry or outside the industry, it's always the same thing, just recycled, tweaked just a little bit, right? So I, that stood out to me. And the biggest thing that he said was digital transformation versus change management. You know, the term or the buzzword digital transformation has caught wind, but it's really just change management. And I was curious what you thought on that. I mean, I in my mind, yeah, they're both they're both change, right? But digital transformation is focused on technology, whereas change management, to me, has just been about people, right? for the most part. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I think it should be more integrated or maybe hard to separate uh, than, than they are. Um, but you're right. I mean, digital transformation in general, people think of technology and change management. People think of people, but really, you know, you need both for most transformations. I mean, most transformations nowadays involve some sort of technology, uh, whether it's, you know, ERP or CRM or HCM, you know, any sort of human capital, customer relationship, enterprise types of technologies. Um, but you can't do that without the people side of it. So it, it's kind of hard to, I think people do treat them as a separate discipline sometimes, which is how they oftentimes get into trouble is because they, they treat the people side of it as sort of a separate initiative or a separate team or a separate skill set, which is you do need a separate skill set and you need that focus, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a separate initiative or something that you're just sort of doing in parallel or in tandem with the, with the transformation. It should be a lot more integrated with it for sure. Right. No, I agree. I feel like today in today's world, technology is so deeply ingrained into just how any business operates that it's, it's interchangeable. It's like part of the people. <laughs> so that's a, that's a good point. Kyler, what do you think of their interview? Oh, I love John Reed. I, I just really love to, this is one of my favorite interviews you've ever done, Eric, because I just feel like he matches your disruptor attitude within the industry um, and just is, has this really fresh perspective of saying, like, this is what this actually means. Um, and as the buzzword queen, admittedly, you know, I, I was... <laughs> I was kind of hurt by the the overall unpacking of digital transformation, but it is so important to your point, Parisa, of just understanding what exactly does this mean for me in my business. I think the thing that I learned from John's kind of top eight, if you will, list of things that you need to be successful was just the important the important um, partners that you choose, and really how they do have to be really experienced and specific to your industry. So you could get, you know, this shiny pitch PowerPoint and it looks so cool. And I'm the first to become enchanted by all of those types of things. But really when it comes to have they implemented or selected software for your industry before, um, and that really is truly an incredibly important thing. Um, and I know here at Third Stage, I'm always so fascinated by what our teams have done because we it's the most eclectic groups because some people have implemented software for Fortune 100 companies and then others, um, you know, have implemented software or helped a llama farm choose <laughs> what they should be utilizing for their overall in inventory. So lots of great stories. But I just um, I thought that that piece really was kind of a key takeaway um, for one of my key learnings. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree with your, your comment about, you know, his, his, uh, disruption or his dis disruptor status or approach and what's fascinating about their business models. You know, they're one of the few media slash industry analyst outlets out there that are, you know, he's, he's pretty transparent about the fact that they make money from vendors, like, like most analysts and media outlets do. Um, but they have found a way to not totally sell out. You know, they're, they're generating revenue and making money the way they need to, but they're, they're still staying true to their beliefs and, you know, sort of uncovering the, the dark secrets of the industry at the same time that they're also, you know, being supported by the industry. So I'm pretty impressed that they're able to, to walk that, that fine line and, and sort of provide that brutal reality, uh, to people just to give them that sort of gut check, you know, they're not trying to sugarcoat anything 
you know, just like, and I think that's how we are too, you know, in, in a lot of the marketing and thought leadership we put out, we're just trying to be honest and share what reality is like, not some sugar-coated view of reality. That's right. The authentic view, the the transparent view, that's everything is, is what are you getting into? It's, it's fairly black and white. And if you guys are interested to our listeners of checking out that website, it's diginomica.com and they have lots of articles, lots of insights uh, that are very insightful. So highly recommended. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very good stuff. Were there, were there certain trends that he mentioned or uh, even though I think, but to your point, uh, Parisa, he's, he's trying to, I think, hesitate, he hesitated to use the word uh, trends, but he was sort of talking about the some of the big things that are changing in the industry as well as the um, the underrated keys to success. Was there anything that sort of jumped out as super interesting or particularly interesting of the, of the things he mentioned in that discussion? Yeah, I mean, so the the segment where you guys touched on modern enterprise technology. So, you know, the the transition of where ERP systems were back in the day to where they are now, it sounds like he's very much in favor of it. And it has a very promising um, trajectory, if you will, just because it's enabling businesses to kind of take that power back and and run with their own operations, kind of customize things how they want it rather than fitting into, you know, what an IT team can build for them. And, you know, it sounds like, you know, not to bash on IT teams, but there's a lot of bottlenecks that could happen in, in the coding process and in the engineering process. Um, whereas today, it sounds like it's just a lot more streamlined with where things are going. So, you know, I'm kind of curious on why that is. I mean, do you think it's because of more and more cloud technologies rolling out and it's enabling, you know, people to kind of just take back that operational element or is it something else that's you know, kind of making the modern enterprise technology a little bit more accessible. Yeah, I, I think it's all the above. I mean, it, it's, uh, I mean, cloud technology has certainly made it easier to deploy or, uh, you know, get the technology to or in the user's hands, I guess you'd say, it doesn't necessarily make it easier to integrate into a business, but it does make it easier to actually access, you know, physically access the technology. Um, and the other part of it, I think, is just the the level of competition. I mean, there's so many competitors in the space now, and it's not just um, you know. When I started in the industry, it was it was sort of like you know SAP and Bond. You know, Bond was still a pretty big thing back in the '90s when I when I started consulting, and uh, you know some of these newer upstart types of companies like you know NetSuite wasn't around then, um, Salesforce wasn't around yet, Oracle was around, but they were more of a database company. They weren't doing a ton of uh, ERP stuff yet, or at least they weren't as strong in it as they, they are now. And Microsoft hadn't really entered the space yet. So now all of a sudden you fast forward to the 2020s and you've got so many different players, not just in the enterprise wide technologies, but also in, in all these different niches, whether it's an industry niche or a functional niche like Salesforce with, with customer relationship management, and Salesforce automation, or um, you have Workday on the human capital management side. And the human capital management side, by the way, is sort of a a newer type of enterprise technology. So you have a lot of different competitors, a lot of different niches. Um, and then, you know, I think just the changing world and the economy and businesses in general changing so quickly, that's, that's you know, sort of speeding up and accelerating the, the pace of technological change, which is, you know, making it easier in some ways for, for organizations to, to, to be more, not be more accessible, but to have access to uh, more of these technologies. Interesting. I mean, sure, and I know, go ahead, Sorry, Kyle. Go ahead. I was just going to say, and I know a, a pillar here at Third Stage that they really, um, our project teams really preach to businesses, and hopefully, hopefully, it's helping to buck that trend. Is the importance of this is a business decision, right? This is not a software IT decision, and a lot of that evolution, I think, has come from failures, which you talk a lot about. Eric, too, is just you had an IT project, it went through your pipeline, and you're not seeing any ROI from that actual software because you didn't involve your sales team or your manufacturing team or all of that. So hopefully that more definition of modern enterprise technology does include all of those core influencers within the project space. Interesting, like the holistic approach to it right. to make to pull the whole project through is what the modern enterprise technology really is. It's the whole shebang, if you will. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's it's sort of like the, you know, just bringing it back to the conversation we had earlier at the beginning of this episode around, you know, electric vehicles and autonomous driving cars. I mean, it's it's just there's so much that's changing and so much that needs to change to support those, enable those changes from a change perspective and a technological perspective. So I think that's, uh, you know, that it sort of brings it all back for full circle to that point as well. Right. And I mean, as we watch these technologies kind of advance, it brings up the conversation of AI and blockchain and these other emerging technologies as well. And you guys talked about it, you and John, about that being, you know, amazing. That's great that these new technologies are coming out, but there's always the underbelly. There's always that, you know, rigid edge that can throw you off as an organization. Um, I think John mentioned the AI recruitment controversy, which it just sounds like that could open up a lot of like a legal problem, right? If you, if an HR team is adopting an AI uh, system to help screen candidates, and then it's totally not even cognizant of looking for diverse employees, I mean, you're opening yourself up to a lot of risk. So it, it sparks the question in my mind of, you know, with any emerging technology, you're running the risk like this, because, you know, that full use case scenario and in, in a various facets is not there. It's really just kind of a proof of concept right now. Like we're still at the beginning of it. So again, I, I think I mentioned this early in the, earlier in the episode, but what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Because if you don't have, you know, a hundred different businesses using this AI technology, the AI technology is not going to grow. It's not going to be accepted. It's not going to, you know, transform as it will to move the industry forward. And if that doesn't happen, then we're kind of stagnant. But there needs to be businesses that take that risk and kind of take the leap of faith to hopefully optimize their operations, but they're willing to risk it. So I guess my question to you, Eric, is in what scenario would you be comfortable recommending an AI technology or really any emerging technology solution to an organization, knowing that there's a chance that there could be hiccups like this? Yeah, it's a great point and a great question. I think, you know, John and I sort of touched on a little bit during the discussion around, you know, this whole concept of, uh, you know, I think he was talking about the, uh, you know, the trends that he, he was talking about some trends, like I think he mentioned uh, blockchain is one that he's not as excited about as, as some of the others, just in terms of the, the, the application, you know, not the technology itself necessarily, but just how relevant is it to, you know, the, the enterprise technologies. Um, but I think that's a, a question that you have to ask yourself as an organization, though, is a, a couple things. One is how mature are you as an organization with technology as it is? Um, you know, that's one thing you have to look at, because if you're a company that's, you know, still on a green, a green screen mainframe based system, and suddenly now you want to jump to an AI driven, you know, pure modern cloud technology, it's not to say you can't do that, but you just have to recognize that that's a huge leap. And it's it's not just, you're not just going to change overnight. And that's a huge cultural change. And there's so much that goes into that. And so, you know, a company that's just struggling to get off their old mainframe system, they might be better off just, just get a basic ERP system in place. You know, don't worry about machine learning and blockchain and AI and all that stuff yet. You can get to that stuff later, but you don't need to be on the bleeding edge necessarily. And, it, you know, you have to you have to really weigh that risk reward. And I think that's, you know, a big part of it is, not just what your maturity is currently as an organization, technologically and operationally, but also what is your risk profile, your risk tolerance? You know, are, are you a risk adverse organization? If you're a, you know, third generation family owned business, for example, you may be more risk adverse than a, you know, a new technology company that's only been around for five or 10 years and has less to lose in, in some ways. So you just kind of have to look at the, you know, the reality of where you are as an organization and be okay with it. I think a lot of companies are, maybe not end consumers, but more the, uh, the industry analyst in the space sort of make it makes it feel as though if you don't use AI, you're just way behind the curve and everyone out there is using AI. No, they're not. They're, most companies are not using artificial intelligence and machine learning or any of that stuff that John and I just talked about. It's stuff that's emerging. It's stuff that some of the leading edge companies are using, but that's not a good or bad thing. It's just, it's just they're in a different spot and they're more adept or more, you know, capable for whatever reason of, of leveraging that technology, but they're also taking on more risk to your point, Parisa, they're, they're, uh, you know, they have, they have to go through more investment and it's more of a, it's less of a proven, um, commodity that they're trying to invest in or deploy in their, in their enterprises. So 
that's the kind of stuff you have to look at is just where are you on the whole continuum of risk tolerance and maturity and a bunch of other variables to figure out what, what the best path for you is. And it may take you 10 years or 20 years before you ever really get to use AI or other emerging technologies. And, and that's okay. Right. And we talked about, you know, it took, you know, electric vehicles aren't brand new. It's taken years for them to catch wind. Cloud technology is not necessarily brand new. It's taken years for it to catch wind. So I anticipate, you know, AI is going to be the same way and slowly, but surely more and more people are going to start integrating it, which, you know, if it's the same system, that means it's going to make it smarter and smarter, <laughs> right? Because yeah, it's the- pattern recognition, right? So the more people use it, the more it kind of molds into what it can be. Uh, so I, I think that's a good point. It's it's how much risk are you able to tolerate? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And how, how yeah, much absolutely. risk are your teams able to tolerate, right? I know John t- touched on that overall just fear of AI taking people's jobs, livelihood, and how do you effectively communicate that, which goes back to kind of our thesis, right, of a change plan and what that would look like as far as integrating something that is so um, new as AI. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and have a realistic plan and how you're going to get there, you know, because I think a, a lot of companies think it's going to be an easier journey as it is even with basic or more basic technologies, let alone more advanced or emerging technologies and just have a clear path to, to get there. And if it takes you longer or takes you a few years to get there, that, you know, that's okay. At least you're moving forward and you're, you're moving the needle along the way. And you also have to make sure that in this whole thing, you're not losing sight of the, you know, the culture that you're trying to drive and sort of the, the operational model that you're trying to enable as a result of all this technology and really f- figure out what pieces of the technology puzzle, puzzle are going to help you get there and which ones aren't and really ignore the ones that aren't, even if it's all the rage and all the analysts are telling you, you should be going with that sort of technology. You can sort of ignore that because it doesn't really matter if it's not in line with your, your longer term roadmap and objectives. Right. Each company is unique. You got to know yourself before you know how to get to where you're going. Right. And yeah. Kyler, you brought up a good point on change management. So I want to jump to that because I, I remember you guys talked about uh, the communication plan. So there was a question from the audience. What are the musts in a communication plan? And, you know, I loved that John said, keep the transparency, you know, talk about the difficulties that you're running into. Like we wanted to keep these features for you, but unfortunately the system doesn't allow it or, you know, address the, the good, the bad and the ugly, if you will. Um, and then instead of talking about the benefit that it's bringing to the company, talking about the benefit it brings to the individual, which I loved that. And I think that's applicable in everything, whether you're trying to get people to adopt electric vehicles or (laughs) adopt a new, you know, technology, it's, it's, everyone's interested in what's in it for me. You know, they're, yeah, they are behind the company, sure, but deep down they're really looking at what will my day-to-day look like. So I guess my question is that holistic change management strategy that we always talk about, yes, it includes the communication plan with the things that John was talking about, but there's so much more that goes into it. It's more than just communicating. So what other high-level components play into a fully baked organizational change management strategy? Well, the the first one that we've already touched on is is the cultural piece of it. You know, understanding the culture today versus the culture you're trying to aspire to, and how you want to move the needle or bend the culture to to match that future state. Um, there's also the the change impact and understanding how exactly people's jobs are going to change. I think that's a an area that most organizations tend to want to gloss over uh, because they don't see the importance of it or uh, even more commonly, they don't fully understand how people's jobs are going to be affected or they haven't thought it through because they're so worried about just trying to get the technology to work or trying to, you know, figure out how the technology is going to be configured and set up and all that good stuff. Um, so that change impact piece of it is very important. Certainly communications and training is important, but that's more of a, I would consider that more of a downstream um, later in the process sort of a, a change thing. And, and a lot of organizations think of training communications as the as their change plan. And if that's all you're focused on, that's just, you know, the tip of the iceberg. And, and if you haven't done anything before that, then it's usually too late or you haven't addressed enough with, with change management. But I'd say the cultural aspect, the, um, 
the uh, change impact, uh, the stakeholder analysis, executive alignment, you know, making sure your executives are aligned on the same page and have a clear vision for what the project means, you know, even just starting as fundamentally as that uh, is an important part of change management. Um, so those are just a few of them. We have, you know, we've done, um, we've had some past episodes of ground control that cover change management in more detail. And certainly on our YouTube channels, um, we, in, in our other thought leadership on our website, we have tons of content around, you know, different work streams within change management, but those are the, some of the high level summaries or, or the main work streams that we typically focus on. Right. And there is a lot of content out there. So if you're eager to hear more about OCM best practices, just search third stage consulting OCM and you'll find a lot. <laughs> um, and, you know, like you said, we talk about it a lot and that's, you know, we talk about success in digital transformation and, and that is one big component of it. And I love that he was talking, John was talking about the underrated keys to project success. And Kyler, you mentioned, you know, picking the right partner, um, you know, put less trust in your system integrator, find people who are familiar with your industry, who are transparent about their, you know, their highs and lows and the challenges that they ran into and how they overcame them. And that's how you should dial in on it. Another thing that he mentioned, and maybe Kyler, I'll pose this question to you, is he he said, send your teams out to the events, to, you know, places where they can speak to other industry professionals to, you know, pick their brain on their experiences. What have they gone through with their digital transformations? You know, what challenges did they see? And, you know, just that interaction alone could be worth thousands of dollars in consulting, <laughs> right? The industry knowledge that you'll get at an industry event is pretty spectacular. So my question is, where would you recommend people go to network and to get involved in the industry um, and kind of reap those benefits? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, that's a that's a great question. And I, I love how John and Eric stress the important, importance of developing your team and your employees in that way. Um, so uh, here at Third Stage, we've, we've done a variety and we attend a variety of different places, um, both physical conference, which in the last obviously 18 months has been a little difficult, but we do uh, full throttle every month that's free. And then we also have our digital stratosphere keynotes that's on um, Crowdcast that are free. Uh, that we put out. So we pump out a bunch of content where you can network um, from a digital standpoint with other industry, whether it be a vendors, SIs, other consultants, other clients that have been through this um, as well. So that's a great place. Um, before kind of COVID happened, that was a whole networking in-person event. Um, we also do a lot on LinkedIn in just looking for groups and, and industry advisors there. Um, and then, you know, our, our different areas in which, at least at third stage, we have full transparency and access to our executives. So if you email Eric, you're actually going to talk to Eric. If you email Brian Potts, who is our CCO, you're going to talk to Brian Potts. So having that ability and transparency to just say like, you know, is um, SAP right for me? And then start that conversation. There, you're going to learn a lot from just having access to not only that content, but also to influencers within the space. And John too. John's a great example of that, you know, in just saying like, I have questions on this or I'm going through this. And then he can give you mountains of content as well as a lot of other contacts to reach out to, um, to talk about what they've been through. Yeah, I hear you. I agree. And, you know, I, I think there's some people who are eager to get out there and network and some people who may be a little bit more introverted and not as eager to go out and put themselves out there and ask these questions. But it is a game changer when you can put yourself out there and ask the questions, go up to somebody and introduce yourself and just start the conversation of, you know, what system do you guys use? I don't know. Just, you know, industry talk. So <laughs> I'm also hopeful because events are slowly but surely, at least in the United States, coming back in person. We're seeing virtual stick. I think you're going to be seeing a lot of hybrid live and virtual events. So, um, you know, if you haven't already, take a look at what's coming down the pipeline within the industry. Um, we have a lot of events, like Kyler said, here at Third Stage, but there's so many out there um, where you can kind of get involved and expand your horizons, if you will. Now, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely opened up a lot of options for people. You know, a lot of a lot of education and events that you maybe otherwise wouldn't attend. 
um, has become a lot more prevalent. And one of the other things I'll add to what you guys are saying is that, you know, it's not just learning, you know, from others in terms of what their, you know, what they're going through or sort of what their lessons have been in their journeys, but also just being able to have someone that can empathize with, with what you're going through. It's, it's amazing how powerful that can be for a lot of our clients. If they can just talk to other peers that are going through the same thing to realize that a, they're not crazy and B they're not, they're not alone. You know, there's, there's other companies that are going through the same sort of thing. I think that that sort of support mechanism is, is extremely powerful and it's a, it's sort of a different angle than what we can give as consultants. And that's one of the areas we try to add value with our client bases to help, you know, provide some of the, the peer, the peer to peer aspect of it as well. Right. Yeah. Digital transformation support group. We should start one of those. I know exactly. It's, community, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad idea. Yeah. And another thing too, uh, with the underrated keys to success, one of the other ones that stood out was a project health check and that there's companies that just come in, you know, it sounded like they just kind of come in out of the blue, not like out of the blue, but you hire them on and they come in at a given time within the transformation to see how everything's going. And I, that concerned me a little bit because I'm like, do they have any context coming into it? Do they know about the project? Do they know about your company? I mean, is there any compromise there since they don't necessarily have the context behind it? Yeah, it's actually an area that we're, we're seeing more and more demand for services from third stage, um, especially in, it seems like, especially in Europe and Asia Pacific and those two regions, we're seeing a lot more of that need or that, that request for that service. And, you know, on one hand, you know, it's, it's a tough balancing act. You, you don't want someone that has no idea what's going on at the project. You need someone that can come in and understand quickly, you know, the lay of the land and understand you as an organization and understand the pros and cons and the strengths and weaknesses of your project as it is now. Um, but you also, it, it can be very powerful to have someone who hasn't been involved in all the day-to-day, -day, you know, politics and, you know, things that go along with a, a transformation like that. So it's definitely a balancing act. It's, it's helpful to have that outside perspective, um, but with good consultants. And I, I, of course, being, being biased as I am about this, think that third stage is very good at this is good at coming in. You need someone that can come in quickly and, and learn your business and, and be able to add value um, right away. Yeah. And just that technology agnostic perspective too. I feel like it brings in that objective view and whether it's for a health check or for a full, you know, from A to Z transformation, having that support behind you to prop you up and not have the biases of a system integrator um, and other partners, it, it helps a lot. So that's a big highlight of, of third stage. And, you know, I think just your conversation overall with John, it, it uncovered a lot of different elements that you can dive deeper into and talk about for hours, it seems. And, right. um, you know, it, I, I was inspired to go look at their website and found a lot of interesting content on there as well. So, I mean, between the two, I feel like you, our viewers and our listeners are able to uncover a lot within their own transformation journeys, but also just in the industry. So great interview. Yeah. 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 It was good to have him on the show and appreciate this discussion too, just sort of unpacking it all and digesting it uh, here as, as we go or after, after the fact is, is, uh, is pretty, pretty powerful. So I um, want to thank you both for um, being on the show here today and uh, another great episode and appreciate your, your help of uh, pulling this together and appreciate ha our guests on the show, having Jonathan on the show as well. And of course, I uh, appreciate everyone that's listening here today. So uh, thank you for, both for being here. Look forward to uh, seeing you all again next week on Transformation Ground Control. Thanks, guys. So have a great week, and we will see you all soon. Take care. Have a great week.